Happy Sabbath. How was your week? Was it good? Well, mine was very good. God was good. And um, I got a call from pastor this week, and it's very nice to hear from our pastors, right? <laughs> um, so he gave me an assignment, and he was explaining the assignment. I had my husband with me, and my mom was there with me, and we were talking, and then I told the pastor, Pastor, you know, I live far away. You know how far away I live, two hours from here. And then I said, Pastor, you know I'm not good at this. My predecessors are better than me, right? And then I said, you know, Pastor, I, I can't do a good job. What, what, was I, what was I saying? What was I doing? Well, <laughs> it, it relates to the title that we are going to be talking about today. Um, excuses to avoid mission, right? Let's have a word of prayer before we start the lesson today. Father God, um, as we begin our lesson today um, in dealing with excuses, help us to understand your mission. Help us to understand that, you know, bring us to a forefront that how important it is for you to save souls, um, you know, because you came down here to die for these souls. So help us to understand that. Help us to understand the excuses that we have. Help us to understand, understand to overcome that. Lord, we need your power. In Jesus' name, holy name, I pray. Amen. So I am going to put display the verses here, and then it's easy for, for you to just read it, read it out loud. Okay. So the first memory text here is Isaiah 6, 8. Can someone read it out loud for me? Then said I, here am I, send me. What a beautiful verse. And I think, please have this in your back pocket. We are going to be concluding with this verse. It is such a great contrast from what we are about to study today. Last week, we studied about Abraham. If anyone can remember, there are three things that we studied about Abraham's life. Three things. That, those are, anyone remember? Hospitality. Hospitality. Absolutely. Can you say it one more time? Hospitality, love, and prayer. Hospitality, love, and prayer. And, and this week, we're going to study about Jonah and what a contrast between Jonah and Abraham's mission, right? What a contrast. So let's delve into the lesson, and we're going to consider the excuses that he made and possibly we can relate to those excuses that we've made in the past and we're currently making, and hopefully we can get past them. Does that sound good? Okay, so Jonah chapter one, one through three. Let's, can somebody read that for me, please? Anyone? It's easier for you, it's right there. I need volunteers. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amatea, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. From the presence of the Lord. So just by looking at these verses, especially verse 2, what do we know about the Ninevites, the Assyrian Empire? It was a wicked city. Wicked. That, that's right there. That the wickedness, I kind of bolded it over there. And, 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 and we're also going to read some, a little bit more about the, the wicked city. And that is in Nahum chapter 3, 1 through 4. Someone else, someone else can read that. Very, very important for our discussion today. I can't see so much. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it and the message that I tell you. It's actually Nahum chapter 3, verses oh, 1 through sorry. 4. Um, okay. 
the noise of a whip and the noise of the uh, rattling of the wheels and of the what is it? Praising horses and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain, and a great number of carcasses, and there are not, is none end of their corpuses. They stumble upon the corpuses. Because of the multitude of the overdumps of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft that seeth, selleth nations through her horodoms and families through the witchcraft. It's a pretty long passage here, but I have some things um, bouldered there. Lies and robbery, some buzzwords, multitude of slain, a great number of carcasses and corpses, multitude of whoredoms, well-favored harlot, mistress of witchcraft. Would you want to go to that city? Well, I would be taking a ship further away from that city. And why? Because I'm fearful. Jonah was fearful, right? And, and that would be our position also. But, but let's talk about this. What would have helped Jonah from being fearful? What would have helped him? I need, I need participation here. I'm not going to be speaking from here alone. So what would have helped Jonah from being fearful? Okay. He needed to depend on God. Very valid point. Yes, Saka? Okay. That's when we get scared of all these things. But as Sam said, when our faith is too much in God, and when we depend on God, I don't think we'll get scared of anything. Conviction. Great point. Faith, when our faith is very little, and we do not depend on God, that causes us to be fearful. Yes, Elder John, you were saying something. No, I, was, I think the same thing what Ben Muli and uh, Sadna said. But, you know, if, when God tells you to do something, you, you know, you don't have to be fearful because uh, God will be with you and uh, you can, uh, you know, go f without any fear. So the same thing what they mentioned. Great point. Depend on God. Great yeah. point. Great point. Yes, we have a comment here. I just thought about Moses. When God had asked Moses to go, he said he couldn't speak. And so he said he was going to send Aaron. Maybe if a partner was sent with him. Uh, Jonah, he would have been more willing to go. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And we have other prophets who are willing to go. Right. Anyone else? Anyone else? How? Yes, sir. I think, I think he needed, uh, I'm just putting myself in his position. Mm -hmm. I think he needed to pray uh, at that very moment. Yeah. Not just to focus on the issues there, but to pray and more, right. pay more attention and focus on God. Because naturally, when you hear those kind of things, the tendency is to fear. But I think he needed to be more prayerful at that moment. Ooh, yeah, faith, prayer. Yes, we need that connection. Without him, we cannot do anything. Yes, sir. Uh, he should have understood that he was created by God. And it was the God who showed and God was the one who gave him the mission to go forward. So if he had little faith as much as Abraham has, definitely that fear would have um, um, yeah, gone from him and he could have definitely um, fulfilled the mission that he was um, interested with. You know, I love the fact that you said he was created by God. So we created beings. We can only depend on our on our savior, right? We can't do anything on our own. Yes, Pastor. Uh, I think we all understand Jonah better probably because we are like Jonah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, when it comes to, when it came to Moses, he spoke his fear out. Mm. But Jonah did not speak anything. He just ran away. That's right. 
Exactly. You preached a sermon on that. I remember that. <laughs> but but let's, you know, we, we are tempted. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I would like to read the text here. Revelation 18. Are we ready? So faith, we touched all these points. I thought of this. Are we in that city? Or we are in this city of Babylon. Mm -hmm. uh, there, the, come, the word of the Lord says, and he cried mightily, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 18, uh, 2 on, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have, are waxed rich through the abundance of her uh, delicacies. Now it comes. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that he be not partakers of her sins, and that he receive not of her place. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now we have the faith. If we do not warn the people that the message has given to us, the three angels message, to come out of our people, first I need to make sure that I have my faith in God to come out of Babylon. That's in me. Because faith, we try to exercise, it's a gift given to us. If we do not exercise, our faith is dead. So exercising the faith, yes ma'am, I'll come to you in a minute. Exercising the faith and also analyze, are we still in yes. Babylon? Yes. Uh -huh. What kind of help we need from God to get out of Babylon? Because he's calling us out of Babylon. Yes, ma'am. When we read about Jonah, uh, Jonah, I, Jonah knew these people very well. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't really want to go. He didn't want them to be converted. That's the point there. We're going to come to that. We have a couple more excuses that we're going to be discussing in this lesson. But you know, the interesting thing is, 2 King 19, verses 32 to 35, we're not going to read all it, but I'll just read quickly. The Lord says, well, first of all, this is um, the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. The history tells us that the Lord promised, I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. So he made a promise. And then it came past that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians. So the Lord had done something in the past, right? So the memory is there, the history is there. But still, Prophet Jonah was so fearful. He did not look at the history, right? Someone else had a comment there. Yes. Most of the time, God has done so many good things for us. We have experienced. But sometimes he asks us to do something. We try to postpone it. Lord, not now. Maybe a little later you tell me, I will do it. So just like Abraham, when God asked him to go out of his place, he didn't even ask a question. Lord, where am I going? He, he, by faith, he just walked. So that kind of faith we all have to have. Amen. Sandy, thank you for that, because what I heard from you is the procrastination. We are very good in giving excuses and reasons to move away from God's mission. Anyone else? Yes. I was just saying all those uh, uh, abominations you have listed, it's here in the previous slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's here and now. We are, like you said, in Babylon. And the commission is given to us by Jesus. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now our focus, um, Jonah's focus should have been in this commission to go and to win souls. And today we are like Jonah, sure. We get scared and we fear about winning souls for Christ. And the Bible tells us, perfect love casteth out all fear. So trusting the Lord, we need to go as the commission to go and reach out souls. That's the mission. And we need to be well equipped with resources. And, and, and where do we get the resources from, Gina? From God, from God himself, right? We need to have the connection. 
Absolutely. So even with the history, even with all the stuff, Jonah still maybe perhaps was doubtful is God? Why is this issue keep resurfacing? I mean, I, I mean, you know, it, it, are they coming back and to take, trying to take revenge on us? I mean, those are the doubts, right? Like you said, we need to be very clear on our mission, right? So are there any other stories in the word of God uh, where a prophet was fearful? Yeah. Can you think of some? Samuel. Yes. Samuel. Samuel, that's one. You want to elaborate on that, Anna? He said, go and anoint the son of Jesse. And he said, if Saul comes to know, he will kill me. That's right. Samuel is one. Yes, my husband Richard. Oh. <laughs> yes. I'm so glad that we are going through this lesson now. Uh, because we as a group here, we have to go out. But we have fears, right? But we still have to go out and do his work. We are called to do it. So we can read and study and do everything, but if we don't do, it's just, it's no good. We have to do it. Thank you. So we have a clear mission, we have to do it. But then again, we in, as human nature are fearful. So we need to, we need the Lord. We need to co cooperate with God in overcoming the fear. Otherwise, uh, it's just a bad fruit, right? We need the fruit of the Spirit. Yes. Uh, if we do not do something on a regular basis, then when it really matters, we'll not do it. Many people are waiting for the Sunday law to keep it holy. But if you don't do it on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, you'll not do it when the test finally comes. It's like running a marathon. You can't run a marathon just one time. We have to continuously do it, right? So going back to my question, so Samuel is one example. The other example I could think of is Elijah. We have Elder Suraj here. He's going to contribute also. Um, so Elijah was quite a prophet of God, right? And, 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 but he was afraid of Jezebel, right? The same Elijah, he would stretch his body over a lifeless child, and then that he would be raised to life, right? Yet, he runs away from Jezebel. And yet, of course, God deals with Jezebel. But, but there's nothing too hard for the Lord. But, but these Samuel stories and, and, and Elijah stories, it makes me resonate that one minute, one time we are stronger, Another time you're overwhelmed with fear, right? That's how life is. So that's a lesson, object lesson. How do we treat or see people who wrestle with fear? Yes. Just a, a couple of weeks ago, we went into Columbus, Georgia. We go there to distribute books. Uh, great controversy and steps to Christ and other literature. So Gina and I went there, and we just carry back pack of books and we give it out. This one guy came and he he looked a little rough. He was sitting there on the side and he said, um, "I gave him the book and he says, you know, I'm a Satanist." Huh? Mm -hmm. he, he he was a Satanist and but he said you are doing a good work, and he took a great controversy from us. And he said that he was going to read it, but he said, I am burning inside. This is what he said. You know, when somebody tells you you're a Satanist and you don't know who they are, suddenly there's a certain level of fear in your heart. But then you have to realize immediately that Jesus is on our side, not on yes. their side. Oh, yes. And so with that, we gave, I spoke with him and asked him if I could pray with him. And he said, yes. And so I prayed with him and he said that he was going to read the great controversy. And I praised God for that. So these are the kind of experiences, not only the prophets, even E.G. White was afraid herself, but then God gave, gave her the message anyway. You know, so we have to be ready for all kinds of people that come our way. Amen. Thank you for that. So what you're saying is initially there was fear, but that you went boldly and maybe perhaps sympathy. You had yeah. sympathy over him, compassionate over him. Yes. But also the scripture says, as uh, so I mentioned, fear thou not. For I am with you. That I am that I am. He is with you. Be not, be not dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee. 
with the right hand of my righteousness. What an assurance, right? Eh? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, so going back to Elder Siraj, also thank you for that input, is that we, have, we cannot judge people because we, every, every one of us go through fears and anxiety and panic attacks and all of that. So we're not going to judge Jonah. We're not going to judge Elijah. We're not going to judge anyone else. But we do need to talk about how can we pass, get past that fear. Great verse. That's an assurance promised from the Lord. We need to take it from him and then exercise it. It's available to us, right? So, so my final question before we get to the second, quest, uh, second excuse, how do we make past the fear if it's clear that God has given us a mission, he has asked us to do something? Personally, in my family, a lot of fear has passed on from generation to generation. I've struggled with anxiety and panic attacks. My biggest fear is like, what if somebody blames me? Now I'm in a path with the Lord. Yes, I do fall. But what if they come to me and say, you know, you used to be this, you used to be that, right? That was my biggest fear. And we need to remember that there is a great controversy between good and evil, right? The fight is not ours. And then we can only get courage from the Lord. Uh, anyone else want to in input? Yes. Something you brought to my attention is, you know, when Satan always trying to, tries to remind us of our past and create fear. So whenever that happens, we have to remind Satan of his future. Yeah. If Satan reminds us of our past, we need to remind him of his future and that I don't want to be part of his future. And that is strength because, you know, all of the promises in the Bible are for believers. If we choose not to believe, that promise is not for us. So if you don't believe that Satan has a deadly future, then we will go along with his plan to remind us of our past and make us get discouraged and fall. So that is a point. Great point, great point. Another point is also, there's a promise right there which you shared, is that I sought the Lord, he heard me, he delivered me from all my fears. So who delivers from all our fears? It's God himself, nobody else. Not a counselor, not a therapist, not another human being. Yeah, they can hear our fears, but they can't solve it. They can't deliver us from that, right? I just want to make a point regarding Jonah. He uh, took his off, eyes off of Christ, and that's when the fear grips the, our hearts too. Yeah, when we uh, take, make a decision to go and do God's work, to go and reach his people, fear sets in because, you know, like Elijah got depressed, and he was hiding in the brook chariot after doing great things for the Lord. So the moment we take our eyes off of Jesus, um, Satan just gets in there and the fear comes in our heart. So it's good to stay focused on Christ at all times. That's why I pray without ceasing. That's the only thing will keep us going, to pray without ceasing. Wow. Thank you, Gina, for giving the problem and the solution. Yes. Uh, so according to this text, fear is natural, but when we look to the supernatural, it takes care of the fear. Yes. Yes. He was scared of those people. Is he scared of them or the, he, he didn't want them to be saved? Because he said when the shipmaster came and asked him, it is because, it's because of me, I am the reason, throw me into the sea. Yeah, we're, we're, we're all like... getting ahead of our study, but that's awesome, awesome <laughs> points, awesome points. And, and I do want to touch on Gina's comment. Twice in that verse that we read, he went away. He, the, he went away from the presence of the Lord. So the point is we need to stay connected, right? So, uh, can I tell you one point? Sure. Um, if I see somebody who is mean and rude to me, I don't want to be near those people. I'm scared. And I'm very scared of snakes. But when I see a snake, I always say, God, help me, help me. That means I'm praying to Jesus. So why are we still scared? As Gina said, we have to, you know, Pray keep praying and, you know, and Pray I just have a little doubt. Does anybody else want to answer Aka? She still has the doubt. Pastor? I'm getting all my steps right in the sanctuary. <laughs> By the way, the fear is from the devil. Is the, and the thing is, when I think of that, 
He is a defeated foe. Why should I fear him? Get lost, you servant, devil, in the name of Jesus. He just runs and flees. I'm, what a promise God has given us. Call my name in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee. Amen. <laughs> he flees. Aka, where is she? She's gone. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's, let's tap into the second excuse. Um, false views, right? So we see or discover in the story of Jonah the idea of an excuse that God, you're saying that these people need to hear it, but I don't think these people deserve to hear the good news, right? Whether it's certain neighborhood, whether it's a certain country, certain social economic level, some of us think that the homeless don't deserve to hear the good news. Some of us do think that the rich do not need to hear the good news, right? So let's take a look, look and see if we can learn something about his attitude and that the faulty view of God that he had. So let's read, again, same thing. We touched on that. Jonas rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid a fare thereof and went down to it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So what faulty view of God is in this narrative? God, yeah? God is everywhere. God is everywhere. I, thank you. Because can we hide from God? Right? Twice he said he wants to go away from the presence of the Lord. Well, what does the Bible says otherwise? Such a beautiful verse here. Whether shall I go from, my, from thy spirit? Or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art thee. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell at the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Yes, yes sir, you have a comment. That's what I wanted to say, that we cannot run away from God. One of his false ideas was that he could run away and maybe hide from God. Yes, yes, yes. Anyone else? Okay. So, there's another faulty view. Um, and he said unto them, somebody else want to read it loud? And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, Upon me. Upon you, upon me. <laughs> so what faulty view that do you see here? And I think I've bolded it. Perhaps God needs a sacrifice? No, he recognized his mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, uh, uh, throw me into the sea. Do you, do you think that that's what God wants? So what happens if I'm thrown into the sea? I die, right? So is that what God wants? What does he want? Actually, there is, there is a part which is not spoken there, and that was the compassion of Jonah on the sailors. Okay, because he did not want them to die. He did not mind dying for his mistakes, but he had compassion on them at, in the sea, but the same compassion he refused to have on the people of Nineveh. Absolutely. Thank you. We, we love our prophets, don't we? And he knew he was disobeying God. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, Pastor. Uh, for sure, he didn't have compassion on them initially, at least, because he was fast asleep. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But what, but what does God need? God, does God need um, that we need to do something? Or what, what does God need? Bible says, if I'm recollecting my memory, God wants a contrite heart and a broken heart. Is that what he needs, right? So, but he doesn't need some kind of sacrifice. Um, Sometimes, you know, we think that if we do this, we make God happy on our own terms. But, but God wants our heart, right? right? The humility, the submission, the surrender, right? Any other points in this topic? Obedience is better than sacrifice. He needed to obey. obey. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Okay, let's, let's go into Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. So... So we know the story. He's thrown overboard. 
God prepares a great fish, and that was a miracle, right? right? Fish catches him, spits it up to the beach, and God says, I haven't changed my mission, which is to show the love of, you know, to the people of Nineveh, right? I want you to go. So in Jonah 3, 4, someone read it out loud for me. Shall be overthrown. What's what's the uh, what's what's missing here? What if our pastor comes and preaches, hey, if you don't do this, you're overthrown? What, what's is, missing here? There is no call to repentance. Thank you. There's no grace, there's no compassion. More of yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so we remember the preaching from John the Baptist. He said there is both the word of judgment, right? And also the word of grace. But why, why doesn't Jonah say that if you don't repent, this, this will happen in 40 days. But if you repent, God is abundant in mercy and kindness and all the good stuff. Why doesn't he say that? He wanted them to die. Yeah, he wants. He, he does not want them to repent, basically. I mean, we are we wonder like that today. Oh. Yes. Wanted them to be punished. He wants them to be punished. Uh, Mrs. Shashila John has a comment there. No, I, was, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, like, uh, we are nobody to judge who God wants to save. You know, if God says he wants to save them, we should not run away from that mission and say they don't deserve to, you know, to be saved. That's none of... Uh, you know, that's not how we should look at our mission. It's not our position. It's not our right. position to decide who God should save or not. Thank you. Yes. We're, we're neglecting the soul who Christ died for. Neglected to? We are neglecting the souls neglecting whom the souls. Christ died for. So, in other words, we have no love for souls. So, if we make a decision in our heart that I don't, I'm going to speak. Yeah, I'm preaching, but I don't have to preach the extensive of God's mercy and grace, then that can lead to them not knowing the full truth. What Gina, what you're saying is that we are saying essentially, I don't have enough love for you. I mean, the, God came to die, so I don't have to explain the full grace, the full gospel, right? But Jonah, he wanted them to be destroyed. That's what was in his mind. Thank you. Yes, he does not want them to repent. Anyone else? Yes. See, <clears throat> it was the desire that God wants to save Nineveh. It's not anybody's desire. So he chose Jonah. So when Jonah refused, because he feared himself, so he was forgetting that because God is using a human agency to reach out people because he doesn't want anyone to uh, die. We know the story when um, Jonah went there, what happened? Because God knew that if my agent, my prophet goes there and there's a possibility of these people saving because he, God knows the end from the beginning. Okay, so God knew that these people needs a prophet because God cannot go um, into their midst because then they would be consumed. So that's why God chose Jonah and Jonah failed initially, but there was, uh, he reconciled later part. Thank you for that. Yes, Pastor. Oh, what a contrast uh, with Jonah and Abraham. Abraham, when he, God revealed he pleaded, pleads with God against that. And here, this man is pleading for judgment. Absolutely. What a contrast. In, yes. Yeah, see, God does not need anyone to do his mission. But he wants to use us, you know, for our benefit and use us to do his mission. See, God could have done it without Jonah's help, right? He could have done it, but he wanted Jonah to be involved in this mission. So to what, say. what you're saying is 
he is trying to help us help yeah. others. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could I also mention the, in connection to this, could I also mention in connection to this, uh, does God uh, take care of his people though we go against him? Uh, reaching out other people who are not converted? Because in the previous leader he, in, the, in the boat, right? He was disobeying God. And through God's providence, the people who were there, they worshipped God. They got converted. So also, Nineveh. Yep, that's, that's that, this verse right here. You I know. have a question. Yes. Don't you think the people of Nineveh knew about God? Because if you go to someone who doesn't know about God and say, in 40 days, God is going to destroy this, and they converted it's not going to happen unless they knew they know who God is and what God can do and how God can save them. So I think they already knew who God was, and Jonah was just sent to deliver the message that they already knew but had totally disregard. Amen. And they just kind of needed some revival, right? Well, see, God knows the end from the beginning. We have to understand that first. So when God sent... Uh, um, Jonah there, he knew that Jesus would talk about it later. And in Matthew 12, 41, is, Jesus says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here, talking about himself. So, you know, that God already knew that this generation was going to repent. But he sent a prophet who did not want them to repent. And so sometimes we have to be very careful how we choose or give excuses to go and reach people because we think that caste or that people or their, that country doesn't need to hear about God. You know, but God in his mercy saw that generation and Jesus commanded that generation that they would rise up in judgment Thank and they you. would be saved. So that's the point. Thank you for that. I think we touched a lot on the faulty views. Um, I think I have only five more minutes here. So, uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, so when we read the story, we always think about the people of Nineveh. How about Jonah? I think Jonah needed a conversion uh, because he probably was not fully committed and did not understand the depth of God's mercy. So maybe God was trying to save him by sending him to Nineveh. Absolutely. We need the conversion ourselves. We need the transformation ourselves before we can go and reach somebody else. Yes, Aga. I think the story of Jonah reminds us that we as the last day church should be like him going and spreading the three angels message. We should have the conversion in our own hearts and tell everybody, anybody, people that are standing even on the counter behind you, Tell them that the Lord is coming. Tell them that the Lord loves them and his coming is very soon and judgments are about to begin. You know? Can you elaborate how can we have the conversion? How can having an intimate relationship with the Lord, spending time reading a Bible, praying, the Holy Spirit changes you. You yeah. cannot change yourself. Absolutely. It happens, you're transformed. You don't have to do anything. Praise the Lord. Just all he needs our contrite spirit. Yes. Uh, we would be like Jonah if we come week after week only here and don't reach out. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Good point. So, as Mrs. Lisa said, um, so we have to reach out to people, but there are some people out in the world who will really get angry on you, right? So, what should we do? Of course, our faith has to increase in God. So, don't be scared of such people. So, so let's let's answer that question with a question, Aka. What, would, what did Jesus do? Did he take those things personally? Right? He had a mission. He kept marching. So again, without his power, we cannot do anything. We cannot do anything. Let's start collect the offering. I had a lot of notes here. Great, great collaboration. I'm so pleased. Yes. Jonah was trying to do his method, but only Christ's method works. The mission belongs to Christ. Remember that. Yeah. We are only called. And those who call, God equips. So Jonah forgot Christ's method. Christ's method first is compassion, right? 
and then Christ meets them where they are at. Christ goes to the people, not wait for people to come to him. He goes where they are and meet their needs. And then there is an opportunity for the gospel to be presented. So it's God's mission, but we need to follow Christ's method. That's exactly. what you're saying. Yep. Yeah. We need to align with God's mission. Yeah, we need to align with God's mission. Thank you. I had a whole bunch of notes, but I think let's wrap up. I think I only have a couple more minutes. Um, this is so important, and I don't want to leave without these verses. And I'm going to read it as fast as I could. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting up on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woo is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, O Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim, said unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon the mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine equity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Then also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will, who will go for us? What do you guys... I mean, there's a lot of excuses there that he's going to be given a difficult task, Right? A difficult assignment. The half of the verse 8 says, he responds by saying, then said I, here I am, uh, send me. Right? So, so the first seven verses, there's something here that we've been, it makes sense that we've been studying about the excuses. And Isaiah had the courage to abandon all the excuses and say, here am I, send me. Right? So, so tell me about the first seven verses. What do you observe from this? Well, he was acknowledging his fault. He was not really making an excuse. When he saw the glory of God, he says, I am undone. Acknowledging it. He had experience with Jesus. He had experience with God. That's what I see. He saw the glory of God, the character of God. And, and, and the verse also talks about the guilt is taken and the sin atoned for. Right? And... and, and there's something else that's happening, supernatural. Anybody can identify that? I have one minute. <laughs> he was touched by the fire from the altar, something supernatural, right? When, this is what happens when we abandon all of our excuses, when we come to the context of encountering with a living God, right? What is, is that fire from the altar? What is that fire from the altar? Another elder who's qualified than me can share that? Yep. Uh, I think, yeah, it's the presence of God himself. God is a consuming fire, the Holy Spirit. And I think a person gets qualified for mission when they first realize their unworthiness. Amen. That is step number one. And we'll realize only when we see God's glory and holiness. So many times we don't go out because we don't see God properly. Thank you for that. And I'm just going to close with this. Um, it is the freedom from all the shame and the guilt and the sin, right? And all of that, that's when the supernatural thing happens, right? God enables us, and Isaiah recognized he was in the presence of God. So us women of God and men of God, we want to join God's mission, right? But we may be struggling with a lot of excuses, fear, inconsistencies, depression, anxiety, panic attacks. But, but, but we need that supernatural touch. We need that encounter with the Lord. And is, the question is, I'm, I'm, that I'm going to leave that, is God able to do that for us? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. How do we know that? It's written. It's written. He's more than willing. Yes, it's recorded in the Word. 
and we just have to have that faith. So that's what I want to leave that with. And thank you so much for the participation. I'm, I'm really, really happy. Let's just close with a word of prayer. Father God, as we studied the subject, the story of Jonah, the mission is so real, right? The souls are waiting. They wanted to hear our, the, the good news, my Father Lord. Give us that, enable us, give us that knowledge uh, so we can uh, overcome that fear with your power and share this knowledge. Throughout the day, Lord, help us to keep the Sabbath day so holy because, because uh, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for Sabbath. And thank you for being with us in the study. In Jesus' name, holy name, I pray. Amen.